We've already waited too long to deal with this climate crisis. Wildfires burn more than 5,000 acres in the West. More intense and powerful hurricanes pummel states across the Gulf Coast. Historic floods, severe droughts have ravaged the Midwest. We see it with our own eyes, we feel it, we know it in our bones. We're putting 162 million tons of man-made global warming pollution up into the sky every day. Climate change is disproportionately affecting people who can't afford it. Climate change impacts every aspect of the geostrategic environment. It actually drives insecurity globally. The biggest obstacle we have in tackling the climate crisis is our will to do it. We have the technologies, we have the expertise, we have the scientific backing. What we need is the conviction. What we can do to help is to get engaged, to make our voices heard. We need to make sure that we invest in our country and in the future technologies that we know will make us successful. It's really important over the next 10 years that we disproportionately act as if our life depended on it, because in many ways it does. We will work to come together here in our country and around the world to build and protect our common home for generations to come. Welcome to Action Planet, meeting the climate challenge. I'm Zinclair Samoa with Now This. In honor of Earth Day, we have partnered with Discovery Plus to examine the urgency of addressing climate change and its impact on our daily lives. With the planet's temperatures on the rise, there's a renewed urgency across public and private sectors to address the challenge of climate change. Rejoin the Paris. On his first day in office, President Biden signed an executive order declaring the climate crisis a priority for his administration. Hi, Deborah Holland. He's chosen cabinet secretaries with long-standing careers working on climate issues and appointed the first White House climate advisor. We know enough about climate solutions that they can be cheaper, we can be smarter, we can grow jobs by implementing them. Tonight, we will speak directly to Vice President Kamala Harris about why the Biden-Harris administration has made addressing climate change a top priority. We will examine how outdated modes of producing energy disproportionately impact low wealth communities and people of color how land erosion and rising sea levels pose a threat to our national security. And we'll look at how renewable energy is on the rise in the number one coal producing state. We will begin by looking at how climate change impacts public health and discuss whether a once in a century pandemic like COVID-19 may become more frequent if we don't slow Earth's rising temperatures. China is trying to contain an outbreak of the coronavirus. The World Health Organization has now officially declared a pandemic. We've seen a number of governments closing their borders. 12 confirmed cases in the U.S., more than 28,000 worldwide. We will see more cases and things will get worse. For the past year, the world has been brought together by a devastating pandemic that has taken the lives of nearly three million people. In the U.S. alone, we have lost more than half a million lives. Experts predict that the impact of COVID-19 will be felt for decades to come. New York City was an early epicenter of the pandemic. The first case was announced February 29th, 2020, and by the beginning of April, the hospitals were overrun.
The moment that we realized that things were changing significantly was, I think, around mid to late March. It was almost like night and day. You walked in the day before and everything seemed to like, okay, and then it came. 22-year ER veteran Dr. Deborah White works in the Montefiore healthcare system in the hard-hit Bronx. By the end of March 2020, they had 650 COVID-19 patients. People would be scared to be walking past you because I'd be in my scrubs. And, you know, obviously that means I'm working with people who have COVID. Dr. Michael Doherty was in his third year of residency in Coney Island when the pandemic struck. This entire driveway filled with ambulances backed up, with a couple of ambulances parked on the sidewalk. And some ambulances actually had to pull the patients out and take them up the ramp. COVID-19 was not a black swan. It was predicted, it was well known that we were facing this risk. It wasn't a question if, it was a question when. Climate experts around the world are raising concerns about the impact of reckless environmental policies and public health. Burning fossil fuels is leading to the early death of 300,000 Americans every year and 8 million people around the world. That's one in five people are dying because of our reliance on fossil fuels. COVID-19 is like a sneak preview of what we expect to see more of with climate change in the healthcare setting. You couldn't get through a shift without somebody needing to be intubated or somebody's heart had stopped. It wasn't that there was just one code per shift, it was that there was one code every 10 minutes. It felt like we weren't even able to finish stabilizing someone before we had to move on to resuscitating another patient. Could feel a little bit uh, hopeless at times. Burnout among medical providers was already a huge problem before COVID happened. And then COVID happened and we saw healthcare workers stretched to the absolute brink. Both of my parents became ill. They contracted COVID. They were both admitted to the ICU. My father was really struggling to breathe. My sister sat down on that ledge and um, she was crying because she couldn't believe what was happening. I had to try to explain to her that things weren't gonna go well. And later that evening, we made the decision, my sister and I, they turned off the ventilator and, and we just kind of let him go. But I had this feeling that I, I couldn't stop because that's not what my father would have expected. I was back at work at eight and I started the routine all over. I really, you know, I did it for my parents. My mom was still in the ICU. At one point, we thought we were going to lose both of them, but I think he left so my mom could stay. We're playing an ill-fated game of Russian roulette with nature right now. Infectious diseases are climbing latitude by latitude, just as ecosystems are changing. We have pandemics on the scale of COVID-19 caused by diseases like malaria every year. Dengue infects 96 million people every year and has been increasing exponentially on every continent except Antarctica. In some of the U.S. states like Florida, Georgia, Texas, we've even seen local cases of transmission of dengue and Zika. And as the climate becomes more suitable for these mosquitoes, it's going to become a much bigger and more expensive problem. 
Climate change matters to the health of everyone in the United States because every aspect of our health depends upon a stable climate. Even small differences in air pollution can lead to really higher risks of dying from COVID-19. And it's not just COVID-19, it's influenza and other respiratory infections. And we live in this hyper-connected, globalized world where one disaster in, in one little corner of the planet can spill over. Some of our work shows that in the Brazilian Amazon, as you cut down forest, each square kilometer of forest loss can lead to about six additional cases of malaria transmission. Environmental policy needs to account for the human health costs when we change ecosystems. The reality is, Pandemic Prevention Acts are climate solutions. We have to do both, and we can do both. This is the decade when we not only have to cut global emissions by half, but we have to halt the destruction of nature to stand a chance of avoiding irreversible changes beyond this decade that we cannot turn around. We are at an urgency point.